Assalamu alaikum, hello, and welcome. I'm Dinesh Bhugra, past president of the Royal College of Psychiatrists, World Psychiatric Association, and the British Medical Association. I'm going to be talking today to you about burnout uh, in medical students, and uh, I'll be touching upon uh, the issues that face uh, doctors in relation to burnout. One of the big challenges is that um, it's, we all work under very stressful conditions, and particularly the pandemic has shown that uh, there is an incredible amount of stress. These stressors put pressure on us, and our reaction when we are put under pressure, the feelings we, we get when we are under stress, um, make it difficult for us to cope with things. And burnout has been defined as a pervasive and debilitating state resulting from an unsustainable period of overwhelming stress. So it has a physical, emotional um, exhaustion, along with mental exhaustion. And there have been cases, certainly in the UK in the last year or two where uh, residents who have finished their own call uh, driving home have ended up uh, falling asleep at the wheel and in rather tragic cases uh, there have been deaths. So the three components of burnout, there's emotional exhaustion, uh, depersonalization and an absent sense of personal accomplishment. Emotional exhaustion is that feeling constantly pushed, uh, not being able to carry your work very effectively or for students to learn effectively, and it affects relationships and life outside work as well. And depersonalization is about uh, feeling unempathetic, impersonal responses to interaction with patients and their ca carers, uh, giving a message that I don't really care because you know I'm tired, but I cannot acknowledge that. And there is this poor sense of self-accomplishment. And there's a distinction between burnout and stress. Stress is about over-engagement. Burnout is about disengagement. In burnout, you get blunted emotions, whereas in stress, you get overactive emotions with a degree of urgency and hyperactivity. And um, motivation and hope gets affected in burnout. And there are a number of reasons. Um, lack of control over workload and um, lack of latitude in making decisions, ability to make decisions, getting in as a result of monotonous, boring work or being very chaotic. And in healthcare, it's mundane routine work, which is interspersed with complex, urgent, emotionally demanding tasks. And you can see that happening in the time of the pandemic. And there are uh, particular personality traits, which such as perfectionism, wanting and needing to feel in control, uh, competitive, uh, which are all necessary skills for admission into medical schools and uh, problems that happen as a result. So what makes us ill are work factors, societal factors, uh, physician personal factors, as well as clinical factors, and there are three stages of burnout. The first stage is stress arousal, which is typified by difficulty in concentrating, memory lapses, irritability, anxiety. Second stage is, you know, you try and conserve energy. And uh, that may lead to maladaptive strategies such as avoiding being late at work, not answering your phone calls, uh, excessive sick leave, and third and Final stages associated with anxiety, depression, suicidality, apathy, and poor decision making. And as I said, uh, that you know, when you're feeling burnout, you don't answer your calls, unexplained long absences, low work rate, arriving early, leaving late, but not being able to do a lot of work. And then within clinical settings, a uh, sense of rage with bursts of temper, shouting matches, etc. Often it happens is that if uh, you know nurses or um, others see somebody burning out, they tend to find them a way of uh, avoiding them. 
Um, and then obviously there are problems, uh, you fail your exams, uncertainty about career choice, feeling disillusioned. Um, it can lead to medical errors, impaired professionalism, reduced patient satisfaction, as you can imagine. And as a result, quite often people will move from job to job, um, trying to change things and may lead to depression and suicidal ideation. And in an interesting study, it was shown that um, the first postgraduate year uh, shows very high levels of mental health problems, particularly of depression. And obviously there are factors like family background, personality um, and coping strategies, which influence uh, mental health problems. And in this uh, Australian survey, um, the, there was a clear uh, association between stress related to training and work related burnout and depressive symptoms. And there is increasing demand on junior doctors. So there are two um, inherent double binds about it. Uh, there is a stress of doctoring, I mean, particularly for me medical students and trainees, we expect them to be able to relate to patients, be empathic um, and be humane. And yet at the same time, we expect them to be professional and keep their distance. So we're giving them a mixed message, which makes it very, very difficult for people to understand what they ought to be doing. And that adds to that sense of um, isolation, uh, feeling alien and feeling tired and depressed. And the second double bind that happens in medicine is that we expect people to be highly critical of the self, uh, which leads to high rates of depression. And we need to be obsessional and self-critical so that we don't make mistakes because patients' lives uh, depend on that. And in, uh, 2018, October, when I was president of the British Medical Association, we did this survey uh, using Oldenburg burnout inventory, which has two dimensions. One is exhaustion and the other one is disengagement from work. And the risk of burnout was largely driven by exhaustion. So we had about 4,300 usable responses 80% of the doctors, uh, respondents, and these included medical students who are at high or very high risk of burnout. And more than a quarter had been diagnosed as having a psychiatric condition in the, at some point in their lives and 7% within the past year. And those, not surprisingly, who worked long hours uh, were more likely to suffer. And 90% of uh, respondents said that uh, their current working training and studying environment had contributed to their condition. What was even more worrying, and I'll come back to that, is that one in three of the respondents were using drugs or self-prescription, self-medication to cope with their symptoms. Um, men and older doctors were more likely to do that. And we then did a qualitative um, study when, where we found these five major factors. There were systemic factors which are related to structures, systems, and processes. There were occupational factors, the nature of the job. There were interpersonal factors, the relationship with peers and uh, being part of a team or not. And practical issues related to workplace environment, not having... Um, space to rest or uh, excess food. And then there were uh, wider sociocultural factors. And when I present the medical students data, uh, that will become clearer. Um, so systemic factors included, um, you know, certainly increasingly there's blame culture. If, you know, quite often um, when things go wrong, doctors, get blamed when things go right, you don't get any credit. Uh, so those traumatic events uh, do um, affect us and particularly uh, the pressures from the General Medical Council and keeping skills up to date and uh, your uh, annual ap appraisal and having certain amount of uh, continuing professional development, et cetera. And then there's obviously uh, issues related to hierarchy and intergenerational differences because the younger generation have different perceptions of 
work-life balance and what they need to do and what they ought to be doing. And as I said, environmental factors, uh, you know, traveling long distances, not having uh, time for uh, breaks, uh, lack of basic amenities and staff, uh, mess and so on and so forth, feeling undervalued and changing patient expectations do put a lot of pressure on uh, doctors. So following on from that, we did uh, a survey of medical students focusing very much on that. So in addition to Oldenburg burnout inventory, we used GHQ-12 to measure common mental disorders, and we used GAGE to assess alcohol use, uh, obviously in addition to basic demographic details and confidentiality was assured, and this was an online survey carried out in 12 countries with over 3,766 medical students taking part. One of the caveats you have to bear in mind is that when you're doing online surveys, uh, quite often uh, it's very difficult to know how representative that sample is, that because sometimes uh, people who are tired or who are fed up or who want to convey something uh, will take part in those. So I'm going to not go through in great details, but just highlight some of the uh, headline figures. I mean, in this slide, for example, uh, if you look at the Hong Kong data, although the numbers are smallish, 87% scored positive on general health questionnaire, 95% uh, reported disengagement and 95% uh, uh, reported exhaustion. Uh, similarly, in um, uh, Paraguay, for example, 95% uh, scored above uh, the GHQ cutoff and 61% had uh, disengagement and 99% felt exhausted. Now, that raises some key questions about are we getting uh, the right answers? Are we asking the right questions? And what does that mean in terms of how do we try and um, understand that, you know, as I said earlier, that uh, it's an online survey, so it's difficult to pin down, but I think it's absolutely vital that we do uh, some qualitative survey to try and understand what's going on. And in, for example, here uh, in Wales, 84% um, disengagement and 87% um, felt exhausted. So it, it's not atypical. The numbers right through the 12 countries are quite high, which is worrying. And then when we looked at um, alcohol and cannabis, for example, in uh, Morocco, 5% uh, scored positive on cage in India. It was 8% in Italy, 9%. So roughly similar figures. But Cannabis was 28% in Morocco. Uh, so people were using cannabis to um, cope with their burnout. In New Zealand, 18% medical students were cage positive and 35% were using cannabis. And this went to 79% in Portugal. Now, that may be because Portugal has had recently in the last uh, four or five years or so changed its regulations about drug control and cannabis uh, is no longer an illegal substance. So that may explain, but I think this is something that we need to uh, bear in mind. Um, and when we asked them uh, what was stressing them, we looked at four areas, financial pressures, studies, uh, relationships, and housing. And it is quite interesting that, uh, you know, in different countries, different uh, pressures emerged. And I'm just going to again highlight that 98% uh, uh, of the people in Hong Kong attributed the pressures related to relationships and only 27% uh, related to money. And in Paraguay, it was even lower. Um, in India, money, 18%. Uh, but 69% had relationship problems and largely related to uh, parental expectations. Um, in Jordan, for example, 68% had money problems, 52% had 
problems related to studies, but relationship problems were very low and housing problems were very high, which is uh, directly in contrast with Morocco, uh, Morocco where 90% had had relationship problems and 13% were having um, uh, housing problems. So in medical students, so they, you know, there are academic pressures, increased workload, competition for scores, so that you know, higher your scores, that allows you to choose your specialty, high stake exams, and maybe there are too many tests and there are other expectations. And one of the things that uh, several students told me, particularly in the UK, that a lot of uh, teaching is now done using simulation training and they find it very difficult to deal with that because quite often you're using actors to uh, play a role of a patient or family and they said that look you know we know that in the end these are actors they know uh, we know that they are being paid for it so we don't feel the same level of empathy and in clinical years there are uh, pressures related to a degree of supervision, degree of a type of patients, poor role models. And quite often, medical students are seen as a burden rather than a part of a team. Uh, then there are social um, stressors. We know that uh, three quarters of psychiatric disorders in adulthood start below the age of 24. And that's about the age when they've left home and uh, reached the hostels, forming new relationships, forming new friendships. Uh, loss of contact uh, with friends and family, and particularly friends you've grown up with, feeling lonely, and then unrealistic expectations of themselves and of the course, and then family, familial, spiritual, and financial pressures, as I've mentioned. So what should we be doing? I think there are three levels that we need to be focusing on. There's obviously personal. Um, and then there is organizational and at policy or governmental level. And we know resilience is a complex, multidimensional and dynamic. So you need to face your fears, have a moral compass. Religion and spirituality can play a major role. Social support, good role models and physical fitness, etc. So part of the challenge really is when we look after ourselves, we have to care for our own mental health and well-being. Uh, we need to recognize ill health in colleagues and offering support when uh, needed, fostering a nurturing and inclusive environment. So if um, you know one is feeling stressed, go and see a doctor. Don't self-prescribe, don't self-medicate. Um, if you don't want to go somebody in your town or in your city or in your medical college, go somewhere else. Um, use support organizations if they're not available. Um, you know, form peer groups and support groups. Make space for yourself and for colleagues. Seek help early and share problems. When Be shy away from sharing difficulties with family and friends and colleagues because that means somehow we are vulnerable. Because we are doctors, we don't need to be. But remember, you're human just like your patients. You need to identify and prioritize activities. Keep time for yourself. Uh, do things you enjoy, whether that's listening to music, watching films, reading, going for physical activity, exercise, playing cricket, or whatever. Adopt a healthy, balanced lifestyle, good sleep, bit of exercise, good diet, uh, maintain good relationships and support networks, use peer support systems. Sense of humor is very important. Take regular break, breaks uh, whenever uh, you can and uh, find a voice through professional bodies. Seek help early know what the sources of help are, and particularly for young doctors and residents, and as you go through your careers, my advice would be use a portfolio approach. I understand that uh, most of you would be working in private practice, but uh, even within that, every few years, you can change something. 
You can change your special interest sessions, learn about uh, child psychiatry or intellectual disability or addictions or um, sexual dysfunction or something like that. So you can, part of your clinical load changes every seven, eight years. And that's one way of refreshing yourself and keeping abreast of things, being aware of uh, you know, changes in policy, changes in law. And that may itself be important because you can add teaching to your portfolio. You can add policy advice to your portfolio. You can add um, supervision, research. Um, so moral is to change something in your job portfolio every few years. Understand your mind, uh, understand yourself. You know your strengths, you know your weaknesses, what you need to do. So it is a mixture of self-compassion, getting good feedback and um, appropriate lifestyle and good sleep and good diet. Similarly, there is a responsibility on organizations. Um, if you're running a hospital or if you're running a nursing home, it's your responsibility to make sure that uh, staff are looked after. Universities and medical colleges need to make sure that um, avenues for support are publicized. And there has to be a very clear message about confidentiality, whether they are fit for purpose. Uh, certainly in the UK, uh, there is a um, convention of using balanced groups where residents uh, meet once a week, discuss patients. And in that discussion, you can also gain support for uh, your stress, stressors, uh, etc. And similarly, in America, they've used uh, what's called Schwartz rounds, where the whole team, uh, nurses, doctors, occupational therapists, psychologists, so whosoever is involved in that particular patient's care uh, gets together regularly to discuss. But in the guise of discussing patients, you get emotional support, you get to understand uh, what's going on. And it is vital that organizations uh, recognize and prioritize issues of well-being uh, among doctors and particularly self-care. Uh, setting up wellness programs, wellness offices and information, better communication about stress, um, giving people enough space to rest if you're on call, making sure that uh, you know, good quality food is available 24 hours a day if you're on call. Um, and then there's trustworthy confidential monitoring um, and generally, it's important to prevent bullying and harassment and um, encouraging coaching and mentorship. Mentorship is uh, the quite often people who have had the experience of um, going through the system can advise, can meet up regularly with um, a young consultant who's just started his own practice to discuss the stressors and not necessarily dictate what they ought to be doing, but just to guide them, to support them, to try and show other options. Um, and it has to be about sort of moral uh, concerns as well as open listening. I think it's absolutely vital. Medicine is becoming much more technical. It's becoming much more complex. Um, you heard uh, Dr. Rao about uh, the technologies and the impact it's going to have, and that affects our empathy, and that affects our, uh, the way we uh, deal with patients. And it is, uh, some of the medical students have come and told me that uh, they did not uh, join medicine to become technicians um, because the whole era is becoming much more technical and in you know who knows in 10 years 15 years 20 years time with ai and robots what shape medicine would take and what shape psychiatry would take and you know all the sessions on zoom not being able to look at people and their expressions and understand 
and display uh, empathy is going to have uh, major challenges as to how we train and how we deal with our own stress. And it is important to, if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling distressed, seek help early. Don't wait till it becomes a problem. Don't self-medicate. Don't use alcohol. Don't use drugs. There's no need to be ashamed if you're feeling stressed and if you're feeling um, uh, depressed or anxious or worried. You're human, just like your patients. That's fine. Uh, but you have the ability and the capability to look around and see who you can approach, who can provide you with that um, support, with that guidance. Um, and in the end, this will make you a better doctor because it allows you to uh, try and understand where the patients are coming from. Because one of the major challenges is that you can understand if, you, if I'm feeling stressed, then I can understand when a patient tells me that they are feeling stressed, so what that means to them, what it does to them. And I think it is absolutely crucial uh, that uh, you know, we have both formal and informal networks uh, to support each other. Uh, once again, uh, thanks very much for listening. And thank you, Afzal, uh, Imran, and Wahid, and colleagues for inviting me. And thank you for uh, listening. Thank you.